The last law of the 48 laws of power. Law 48. Assume formlessness. By taking a shape, by having a visible plan, you open yourself to attack. Instead of taking a form for your enemy to grasp, keep yourself adaptable and on the move. Accept the fact that nothing is certain and no law is fixed. The best way to protect yourself is to be as fluid and formless as water. Never bet on stability or lasting order. Everything changes. Before I get into the last law of the 48 laws of power, I want to talk about this idea of water. I want to add my own interpretation to how this idea of water is so critical to understanding formlessness. So when we talk about this law, it applies to every single law that has come before it. And the idea of water applies to them all as well. So when we talk about water, we're talking about the symbol for the idea of assuming formlessness. That is what it represents. Its physical manifestation of assuming formlessness is water. But before we even dive into that, what is formlessness? Formlessness is simply having no regular shape or form, constantly adapting, constantly changing. And that is one of the main characteristics of water. It is constantly changing and adapting to its circumstances. Whatever is in front of water, it will find a way to move around it. Whether that be the natural rock eroding from the seawater, or whether that be a tsunami wiping out an entire town. The Hoover Dam will one day collapse. Whether that be a hundred years, a thousand years, or a million years. Water, I promise you, will find its way around the object in front of it. I think water is such an incredible symbol for life. And I want to illustrate this idea because if you can assume formlessness and if you can assume the characteristics of water, then you are like a god. Are you not? Constantly adapting and changing, never taking one shape, never reacting, always responding, being methodical. The list goes on. If you want to be great, you have to be like water. If you want to be the strongest version of yourself, you have to be like water. Now I'll read you a quote. Nothing is weaker than water, but when it attacks something hard or resistant, then nothing withstands it, and nothing will alter its way. Now the following passages I'm about to read you from the Tao Te Ching are not from the actual 48 Laws of Power book. I wanted to illustrate them from my own interpretation that I feel is very relevant and very extremely important to understanding not just this law, but all the laws. Not just this life, but all of your life. Everybody's. So for those who don't quickly know, the Tao Te Ching is a fundamental Chinese text that was that covers and encapsulates the philosophies of Taoism and was written by Lao Tzu. Water is so fine that it is impossible to grasp a handful of it. Strike it, yet it does not suffer hurt. Stab it, and it is not wounded. Sever it, yet it is not divided. It has no shape of its own, but molds itself to the receptacle that contains it. When heated to the state of steam, it is invisible, but has enough power to split the earth itself. When frozen, it crystallizes into a mighty rock. First, it is turbulent like Niagara Falls, then calm like a still pond, fearful like a torrent, refreshing like a spring on a hot summer's day. And people ask me all the time, they have some version of this question pretty frequently. How do you balance the laws? How do you know when to implement this law or this law? There's so many, there's 48 of them, how do you know? Do you, do you have to apply them all at once? How can you do that? That's impossible, isn't it? While this is a good question, it could garner its own video in itself. So I will try and be succinct as possible with its relevance to this law, 48. So how do you balance them? How do you balance the laws? Well, you balance these laws by assuming formlessness, by implementing law 48, by being like water. All this simply means is playing in the context to which you are within, adapting to the circumstances you find yourself and your mind within. No, you did not apply all 48 at the same time. That's physically, it is not possible within my means, personally, I don't know anybody else, to apply all 48 laws at once because they contradict each other. Many contradict each other and in some ways, and so we cannot apply them at the same time. That is not their purpose. We must assume formlessness and adapt to the situation of the time. Now I'll finally get into Robert Greene's interpretation and the keys to power 
and the following stories to the last law. There are two traditional games that can symbolize the contrast of this law, and that is chess and the ancient Chinese game of Go. Now chess is quite linear and direct, and where Go is closer to the kind of strategy that will prove relevant to this world we live in, where battles are fought indirectly in vast, loosely connected areas. And to remind you, its strategies are abstract and multidimensional, inhabiting a plane beyond time and space, the strategist's mind. In this fluid form of warfare, you value movement over position. Your speed and mobility make it impossible to predict your moves. Unable to understand you, your enemy can form no strategy to defeat you. Instead of fixing on particular spots, this indirect form of warfare spreads out, just as you can use the large and disconnected nature of the real world to your advantage. Be like vapor. Do not give your opponents anything solid to attack. Watch as they exhaust themselves pursuing you, trying to cope with your elusiveness. Only formlessness allows you to truly surprise your enemies. By the time they figure out where you are and what you are, it is too late. Keys to power. The human animal is distinguished by its constant creation of forms. So we understand what formlessness is, I explained that before, it's taking any shape and adapting. But what is form? So if the human animal is distinguished by its constant creation of forms, form is the visible shape or configuration of something. It's a particular way in which a thing exists and lives within reality. Rarely expressing its emotions directly gives them form through language or through socially acceptable rituals. So those are examples of form. We cannot communicate our emotions without a form. The forms that we create, however, change constantly in fashion, in style, in all those human phenomena representing the mood of the moment. We are constantly altering the forms we have inherited from previous generations, and these changes are signs of life and vitality. Indeed, the things that don't change, the forms that rigidify, come to look to us like death, and we destroy them. And we, this can be seen so often in the younger generation tearing down, whether this be through positive or negative movements, previously held ideas, philosophies, cultural ways of living, and rebranding them with their own way. And the young show this most clearly, as I said. Uncomfortable with the forms that society imposes on them, having no set identity, they play with their own characters, trying on a variety of masks and poses to express themselves. This is the vitality that drives the motor of form, creating constant changes in style. The powerful are often people who in their youth have shown immense creativity in expressing something new through a new form. Society grants them the power because it hungers for and rewards this sort of newness. The problem that comes later is when they often grow conservative and possessive. They no longer dream of creating new forms. Their identities are set, their habits congeal, and their rigidity makes them easy targets. Everyone knows their next move. Instead of demanding respect, they elect boredom. When locked into the past, the powerful look comical. They are overripe fruit waiting to fall from the tree. Now this is kind of a cycle that the majority of people go through. I guarantee you, your very grandparents who are known for their traditions and their ways of living that they are now stuck with and ingrained with were assuming their own formlessness in their youth. Meaning they were showing their creativity and expressing something new and exciting. And this made their very own parents, so your great great parents, fearful and made them, who became stagnant in their ways, resentful. I hope that makes sense. What I'm trying to say is that it operates within cycles. The majority of people who watch my videos are within a younger demographic. Props to you if you're older, respect. You're obviously trying to still elevate your game in life, even though the stigma of your numerical age wants to stop you. Respect. I wouldn't be surprised if many of the youth that we are witnessing now, many of the generation that we live with now within, if our generation in 20, 30, 40, 50 years starts to become stagnant, it's a natural way of cycling of life and of generations. I wouldn't be surprised if the very people who are assuming formlessness now and constantly adapting, bringing out creativity and shutting down older forms of traditions and, and outdated ways are stuck in their own ways by the time they're 50. People get lazy, people get conservative, people get 
scared and fearful. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to fall for that. You don't have to be locked in the past and to be comical as you grow older. We don't. We don't. You don't have to be the overripe fruit waiting to fall from the tree. You can, as you age, constantly adapt. A great example of this is Gary Vaynerchuk. He is constantly adapting to his circumstances. He is not romantic to his ideas or to where the attention is of our society. He goes where the eyeballs are and he markets accordingly. And I predict him doing this until the rest of his days. Assuming formlessness is not just for the youth, it is for everybody who wants to constantly and who needs to constantly adapt to their circumstances and remain great, successful, bringing new forms of creativity into the world. Because power can only thrive if it is flexible in its forms. To be formless is not to be amorphous. Amorphous means to be without any shape. But everything has a form. It is impossible to avoid. The formlessness of power is more like that of water or mercury, taking the form of whatever is around it, changing constantly, it is never predictable. The powerful are constantly creating form, and their power comes from the rapidity with which they can change. Their formlessness is in the eye of the enemy who cannot see what they are up to, and so has nothing solid to attack. This is the premier pose of power, ungraspable and elusive and swift as the god Mercury, who could take any form he pleased and use this ability to wreak havoc on Mount Olympus. An example of this in real life, still currently, is maritime warfare, which requires tremendous creativity and abstract thinking, since the lines are literally constantly shifting. Naval captains distinguish themselves by their ability to adapt to the literal fluidity of the terrain and to confuse the enemy with an abstract, hard to anticipate form. They are operating in a third dimension, the mind. And this can be applied to any military application that goes on now, whether that be by air, sea or lands. It requires incredible creativity and adaptation on the fly, especially if you're the one making the decisions with the most amount of risk. A really important point here Robert makes, the first important psychological requirement of formlessness is to train yourself to take nothing personally, never show any defensiveness. When you act defensive you show your emotions, revealing a clear form. Your opponents will realize they have hit a nerve, an Achilles heel, and they will hit it again and again. So train yourself to take nothing personally, never let anyone get your back up. Be like a slippery ball that cannot be held. Let no one know what gets to you, or where your weakness lies. Make your face a formless mask and you will infuriate and disorient your scheming colleagues and opponents. And this applies a large degree to the philosophy of Stoicism. Throughout history, the former style of ruling has been most adaptively practiced by the queen who reigns alone. A queen is in a radically different position from a king because she is a woman. Her subjects and courtiers are likely to doubt her ability to rule. Now, real quick, for all the women watching my videos, there's not many of you, a small percentage, but this is especially relevant to you guys because you guys hold a mysterious, underappreciated, really undervalued potential for power. Potential for power. Let me repeat that because it's there. And most of you, unfortunately, do not demonstrate the audacity, confidence, aggression, and masculine energy that is needed to assume formlessness and to assume power. And I don't mean in a manipulative way that you want to take over the world and, and destroy people. I mean in a way that elevates your life and the life of those around you. I digress, I will continue. So when I say queen, I'm saying woman as well. I'm speaking to the female gender as well. A queen is in a radically different position from a king because she is a woman. Her subjects and courtiers are likely to doubt her ability to rule, her strength of character. People do that all the time with women. They doubt them. They doubt their abilities. Not that they don't men, but definitely applies to the female gender. If she favors one side in some ideological struggle, she is said to be acting out of emotional attachment, yet if she represses her emotions and plays the authoritarian in the male fashion, she arouses worse criticism still, either by nature or by experience. Then, queens tend to adopt a flexible style of governing that in the end proves more powerful than the more direct male form. An iconic female leader 
who has exemplified this formless style that you could study further is Queen Elizabeth of England. In the violent wars between the Catholics and the Protestants, Elizabeth steered a middle course. She avoided alliances that would commit her to one side and that over time would harm the country. She managed to keep her country at peace until it was strong enough for war. Her reign was one of the most glorious in history because of her incredible capacity to adapt and her flexible ideology. Now while that's a very short anecdote, I talked about her much more in depth in previous laws, which you can type in and have a look. The feminine formless style of ruling may have emerged as a way of prospering under difficult circumstances, but has proved immensely seductive to those who have served under it. Being fluid, it is relatively easy for its subjects to obey, for they feel less coerced, less bent to their ruler's ideology. It also opens up options where an adherence to a doctrine closes them off. Without committing to one side, it allows the ruler to play one enemy off another. Rigid rulers may seem strong, but with time, their inflexibility wears on the nerves and the subjects find ways to push them from the stage. Flexible formless rulers will be much criticized, but they will endure, and people will eventually come to identify with them, since they are as their subjects, changing with the wind, open to circumstance. When you find yourself in conflict with someone stronger and more rigid, allow them a momentary victory. Seem to bow to their superiority. Law 1, never unshine the master. Then, by being formless and adaptable, slowly insinuate yourself into their soul. This way you will catch them off guard, for rigid people are always ready to ward off direct blows, but are helpless against the subtle and insinuating. To succeed at such a strategy, you must play the Charmeleon, conform on the surface, or breaking down your enemy from the inside. What this means is just biting your tongue in the face of an argument or in the face of aggression, taking the short-term loss or superficial loss for the long-term victory and long-term win. In other words, lose the battle to win the war. In evolution, largeness is often the first step toward extinction. What is immense and bloated has no mobility, but must f constantly feed itself. The unintelligent are often seduced into believing that size connotates power. The bigger the better. We hear that all the time. It's like this idea of materialism versus minimalism. The superficiality of garnering more things, just getting more and more, more abundance. We're in an abundance mentality. People have. We're in an abundant society. We have never consumed more food used more goods and produced more goods, consumed more information, produced more information than ever in history. I, I don't know the stats off the top of my dome, top of the head, but they're incredible if you find them, if the amount we're producing and consuming. And so this reflects on our culture, on our society, on our ideology. People think the more the better. I used to think of myself, here's the thing, it's a really important point, I'm glad I'm talking about it. It's a whole nother video in itself too. People think, Okay, if only I had more money, if only I had more things, you know, more clothes, I need more clothes, you know. I love clothes, I love fashion, I, I feel you, I understand. I love, it makes me feel good, I get it. But, it's like the more, ha more, even more books, like, it's even like the positive connotation of books. I have a list of thousands of dollars worth of books. But here's the thing, I guarantee you I'm going to switch out and one day end up throwing it, not throwing out, excuse me, donating the majority of my books eventually once I... Come to, a com to come to create a large library, just as Elliot Hulse has done. He's recently given away 90% of his books, okay? The abundance mentality eventually has to come to a stop. You eventually have to balance the massive consumerism mind you have with a minimalistic mind. So instead of maybe focusing on buying 100 good books that you heard recommended, maybe, just maybe, you should focus on studying five to ten great books, world-class books that apply to you because they're going to be different to each individual. So finding something that really resonates with you. Oh, look at this. I found it. I'm doing it right now. 48 Laws of Power, a book I've read many times. I've read the shit out of it when I'm summarizing it because I have to re-listen to myself. I have to edit myself. I've heard these laws so many times and now I'm writing about it on medium so basically if you don't want to watch the video and you find reading quicker you can now do that because I'm producing them on medium there's all link in the description if you are curious if not I will go on so basically I am mastering these laws I am committing them to memory so then I can apply them every opportunity I get 
I would rather be great at a handful of things than good at many, if I could pick. And so that is why I pride myself on diving deep in the depth of understanding how this book functions. That is why this, these videos are over 20 minutes. Like this is not a game, this is not some quick 5 minute book summary. That's easy to do. That's fucking easy. It's not easy to distill ideas and deconstruct them and understand why the author said it and how he said it and deconstruct the stories and how this guy who lived thousands of years before me behaved like this and then find images that fucking that don't even exist because this man was not alive when we had photographers and 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 cameras. We're only painters and drawings. That shit ain't easy, but to bring it back, I'm going off on a tangent. Minimalism. Minimalism over materialism. Minimalism relates to assuming formlessness. The more you have, the slower you are, the less mobility you have. I don't want a big house and fancy cars as much as I'd love the Aston Martin DBS I dreamed of as a kid, as much as I want it. I don't need it. It's okay, I'm good. I'm good if I don't get it. I'm good if I don't get the big shiny house with the with the supermodels in my garage. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Shout out to Ty Lopez, man. <laughs> Shout out to Ty Lopez. He's doing his thing, man. No disrespect or love. But to slow down, minimalism over materialism I want less now. I'm trying to get rid of things. And this is my story, this is my perception this is of my reality. And it's working for me thus far because I find the less I have, the less I have to worry about. Um, the less things I have, the better I feel, the less cluttered my mind is. And if you want to see how cluttered your mind is, just sit down in a room by yourself with no distractions, no technology, close your eyes and just watch your thoughts. The less you have and the less you possess, the less cluttered your mind will be. I really believe that. Now, a story that encapsulates this idea, because if you don't believe anything I say, that's fine. You're probably not even this far in this video if you don't. But if you're still skeptical, in 483 BC, King Xerxes, everyone see the movie 300. He's the guy with the shiny gold armor and jewels. King Xerxes of Persia invaded Greece, believing he could conquer the country in an easy, quick campaign. Because he had the largest army that was ever assembled, and it came to about 5 million. The Persians planned to build a bridge across the Hellespont to overrun Greece from the land, while their equally immense navy would pin the Greek ships in harbour, preventing their forces from escaping to the sea. But Xerxes' advisor, Artabanus, warned his master of his grave misgivings. He said, the two mightiest powers in the world are against you. But Xerxes laughed. What powers could match his gigantic army? And Artabanus responded with, the land and the sea. And the land and the sea are symbols of assuming formlessness. They're taking two territories and using them to their advantage instead of just using one. The more land the Persians conquered and the longer their supply line stretched, the more cost it was to feed this immense army. Thinking his advisor a coward, so thinking with his ego, Xerxes proceeded with the invasion. Yet as Artabanus predicted bad weather of the sea decimated the Persian fleet, which was too large to take shelter in any harbour. On land, meanwhile, the Persian army destroyed everything in its path, but it was also an easy, slow-moving target. Meanwhile, the Greeks practiced all kinds of deceptive maneuvers to disorient the Persians. Xerxes' eventual defeat at the hands of the Greek allies was an immense disaster. The story is emblematic of all those who sacrifice mobility for size, who choose materialism over minimalism, in other words. The flexible and fleet of foot will almost always win, for they have more strategic options. The more gigantic the enemy, the easier it is to induce collapse. Now, while the Spartans died at the hands of the Persians, they made tremendous grounds in helping to destroy the Persian army and through many other battles they fought. Their focus as a culture was on having less. They were warriors and they did not meddle in the arts. They were very direct and minimalistic and simple with the way they behaved and studied. They had no system of money or trading. It wasn't allowed. They didn't acquire wealth because they believed it would only sow selfishness and dissension and weakening their warrior discipline. The only way Spartans earned a living was through agriculture, through land, food. And this single-mindedness, while 
sounding superficially, yes, very single-minded and linear, actually allow them to forge the most powerful infantry in the world. Very powerful, very noble. Warriors unseen to the likes of thousands of years. Decades would pass without a single change in their system. And that had worked for them. But this warlike culture came to an end, an abrupt end, in their battle with Athens. So the Athenians actually responded to most problems they had with creativity. They adapted their occasion, creating new social forms and new arts at an incredible pace. The Spartans did not do this. While the Athenian society was in a constant state of flux and adaptation, the Spartans stayed more stagnant. As noble as they were, as highly talked about as they were, where their downfall became was their ingrained habits that they never changed. But here's the thing, the Spartans actually emerged victorious against Athens, against a uh, war that lasted decades. And because they won, they now commanded an empire. Athens was huge. But the Athenian money poured into Sparta. They had never seen this before. They had never f understood what it felt like, what this new culture felt like, what it was meant to have money. And the Spartans had been trained in warfare, not politics or economics. They were unaccustomed to wealth and the accompanying ways of life, and so many became seduced by it. Spartan governors were sent to rule. They succumbed to the worst forms of corruption, and eventually, just like poison, it corrupted everything. Sparta had defeated Athens, which was great, but the fluid Athenian way of life was slowly breaking down its discipline and loosening its rigid order. Athens, meanwhile, was adapting to losing its empire, managing to thrive as a cultural and economic center. Sparta grew weaker and weaker, and some 30 years after defeating Athens, it lost an important battle with Thebes. Almost overnight, this once mighty nation collapsed, never to recover, and that was largely due to their linear, stagnant way of thinking. They never adapted, never changed. And that was actually the transgression of the law that I felt like intertwined nicely with the story about Xerxes and Persia. The need for formlessness becomes greater the older we get, as we grow more likely to become set in our ways and assume too rigid a form. As you get older, you must rely even less on the past. Be vigilant, lest the form your character has taken makes you seem a relic. It is not a matter of mimicking the fashions of youth that is equally worthy of laughter. Rather, your mind must constantly adapt to each circumstance, even the inevitable change that the time has come to move over and let those of a younger age prepare for their ascendancy. Rigidity will only make you look uncannily like a cadaver. Never forget though that formlessness is a strategic pose. It gives you room to create tactical surprises as your enemies struggle to guess your next move, they reveal their own strategy, putting them at a decided disadvantage. It keeps the initiative on your side, putting your enemies in the position of never acting, constantly reacting. That's the thing, most people are constantly reacting to their environment. They're not responding, they're reacting. They're chaotically reacting out of emotion and out of irrational behavior that doesn't come from tact or logic. But if we can slow down and respond, that changes the game. Remember, formlessness is a tool. Never confuse it with go with the flow style or with a religious resignation to the twists of fortune. You use formlessness not because it creates inner harmony and peace, but because it will increase your power. And I actually personally think it can be used as a benefit to increase harmony and peace, not just power, but that's what Robert thinks and this is what I think. Finally, Learning to adapt to each new circumstance means seeing events through your own eyes and often ignoring the advice that people constantly peddle your way. It means that ultimately you must throw out the laws that others preach and the books that they write to tell you what to do and the sage advice of the elder. Now, did you guys just get that? Because I put a little note next to this highlight I did in this book. Because that very statement counteracts this book. I think Robert is trying to send people a subliminal message, whether it's extremely obvious to you already or not so much. I think he's very particular with every single word he puts. He said it, it means that ultimately you must throw out the laws, the laws that others preach and the books they write to tell you what to do. Well, what is this? This is a book based on laws that others, i.e. Robert Greene, are preaching and the books, which is what this is, right to tell you what to do. And what this means to me in my interpretation is not everything you read, not everything you see, not everything you watch or listen to 
is relevant. As great as it may sound, as great as all these 48 laws sound, as relevant as you may like them and love them, sometimes you just have to throw caution. Sometimes you just have to throw all that shit out. Sometimes you just have to be like, nah, fuck that. Even though someone you admire and trust and love may follow this idea and it may have worked for them, that doesn't mean it's gonna work for you. That doesn't mean you can't try, but it doesn't mean you should just blindly follow ideologies by the successful and the great just because they do it. Yeah, successful leaves clues, 100%. 100% success leaves clues. But sometimes you just have to make a fucking decision for yourself. Sometimes you just need to go for a walk, be with your own mind, and make a decision of yourself without reading or watching anything or trying to escape from the problem that you're facing. We're always trying to escape. Don't try and escape from it. Don't try and run from it. Try and be with it. It's my suggestion, my interpretation. And sometimes we hold on to ideas too rigidly. Because even though they are so beneficial to this person or they've been beneficial to us, we don't realize that they may not serve us anymore. He says the laws that govern circumstances are abolished by new circumstances. That means, yeah, these laws are relevant right now, but they may not be relevant tomorrow, so much so, or they may not be relevant to you tomorrow. It is up to you to gauge each new circumstance as it comes. Rely too much on other people's ideas and you end up taking a form not of your own making. Too much respect for other people's wisdom will make you depreciate your own. That is just such an eloquent, just incredible thing. I'm excited because that's truth. That is especially for me. I'm watching all these entrepreneurs. I'm trying to watch a Seth Godin, Gary Vaynerchuk, Elliot Hulse, um, read all these books based on all these people who have done amazing things. Man, the list could go on and on and on. Athletes, um, musicians, artists. And I'm trying to, we're trying to take, 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 take these ideas. And sometimes, wow, when's the last idea I created? When's the last decision I made on my own without consulting some other video or book or reading or without reading something when's the last time i just kind of sat in the corner by myself and be like okay let me think now the funny thing is the thoughts that you think are based on the things you've seen read and watched that's the irony of this whole situation that you can't it's hard to really escape it but depending on how self-aware you are you can make a decision that's based off your own mentality and not someone else's be brutal with the past he says especially your own and have no respect for the philosophies that are foisted on you from the outside to bring this law to a close authority therefore the consummation of forming an army is to arrive at formlessness victory in war is not repetitious but adapts its forms endlessly a military force has no constant formation water has no constant shape the ability to gain victory by changing and adapting according to the opponent is called genius Sun Tzu. Reversal. Using space to disperse and create an abstract pattern should not mean forsaking the concentration of your power when it is valuable to you. Formlessness makes your enemies hunt all over for you, scattering their own forces, mental as well as physical. When you finally engage them though, hit them with a powerful concentrated blow. When you play with formlessness, keep on top of the process and keep your long-term strategy in mind. When you assume a form and go on the attack, use concentration, speed, and power. As Mao said, when we fight you, we make sure you can't get away. That's it, we done. Let's give it a clap. We out here, low 48. 48 loads of power. Woo! That's the last law. That's the last law. Man, this is probably the longest video uh, I've ever done. Oh, it's probably close. Probably close. If you're listening right now, you're in the minority. You, uh, you, uh, I want you to, I'm going to hear you comment. Contact me somehow, please. If you, if you made it this far, shit. Please, please comment. Let me know. Um, I need to send my appreciation to you. Um, show you some love. And if you've seen all of them, if you've seen all of them, Please tell me too, because that's, uh, that's dozens of hours of actual videos you've watched. And I just want to say, I've put in hundreds of hours into these videos. Hundreds. I'm not really concerned at all if um, I get that many people watching them. 
right now I'm just very appreciative of the uh, of the groups of people who have taken a lot of value. But um, I'm talking to you guys, so thank you. If you ever commented, if you ever watched, if you ever liked a video of mine, respect, much love and appreciation. I could give a fuck how many subscribers I have, how many views. But on the other hand, I actually do because it is very relevant to um, growing an audience base. So I respect that too, but I digress. I've tried to deliver a video to you guys every single Sunday. And I think I've done that. I think I've done that for, wow, like 30 weeks straight, 40 weeks straight. It's probably been one week, maybe two weeks where I haven't kept, kept it consistent with the 48 Laws of Power. But every week, pretty much, there's always been a video for about a year. A year. Yeah, about a year right now. Um, and the pro seeing the progression of these videos has been really interesting and kind of laughable at the same time. Not that the first videos were bad. I don't think they were bad because, funnily enough, my first 10 or so videos, while I think the quality is not as nowhere near as high as my current videos and my last um, 10 to 20 videos of my 40 hours of power, well, I don't think they're of as high quality. They actually have much more engagement views and attention. Like, people are watching more of those videos. And this goes just to show, this is another lesson here, that production quality should not be the priority when you want to create something. If you don't have the GoPro or the HD camera to start recording or making your videos, or you don't have the right pen to start writing, or you don't have the right, I don't know, surfboard to start surfing with, or bike, whatever hat hobby you're trying to start, you just need to start because, you know, no situation is ever going to be perfect. And yeah, I just start, man. No one's asking me for advice here. Well, no one's asking me to speak like this on this topic right now. But um, if anything, I'm talking to myself to tell my future self to make sure to start future objectives and have hobbies of mine without needing the perfect equipment. And um, yeah, it actually goes to show because the results speak for themselves that um, more people actually watched the first portion of the, of the laws than the last portion. Statistically speaking, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, but then there's one that's got like all well, three or six or something has like 15,000 views or something like that and um, That's nice because it's a lot of people uh, Obviously all of them will watch it all the way through but that's a decent amount of people that are engaging with it, too um, And the quality isn't that high too. The production is not that high a lot of the times the screen is not there's no visual the visuals aren't changing for like a minute two three four minutes and this is like, like looking back at it like fuck this is not good. You need to constantly adapt and change change the screen and change the visuals and keep the audience engaged, which is what I'm really priding myself on doing now. I'm trying to use as many visuals as possible to engage and create a beautiful piece of art. That's what I see these videos as. They're art for me. They're art for which I can reflect upon and keep continuing to learn. I need to finish this How to Win Friends and Influence People animated series. That's going to be coming now. It just takes me a long time to animate videos. Uh, so that's why you haven't been seeing them. I've just been focusing on this. And uh, if you want to go to my Facebook page, also, um, what I do, what I'm doing now is I'm actually re-editing a lot of the first videos that you guys have seen on YouTube. And I'm actually I changed the visuals up um, a little bit. I'm trying to make it more engaging. So if you ever wanted to revise the videos, I'd actually go to Facebook as well. And if you wanted to read them, I'm now transcribing every single law into written content. I'm up to I believe law six. By the time you read this. I'll obviously be who knows how many laws on Medium, uh, medium.com that is, an incredible writing platform I suggest any writer wanted to use, who wanted to just uh, start writing. Yeah, I'd use that. If, you, you know, if you're up to Law 48 and you've seen the majority of these videos and you haven't bought the book, buy the goddamn book. I could give a shit if you use the affiliate link in my description. Um, no one's even used it yet. It's only for Australians that is, because fuck Amazon, because they cut me off, because... Uh, I wasn't getting enough um, people clicking and uh, buying through that, so fuck them. Um, I love you, Amazon, though, so uh, you're actually pretty useful to me. And if you made it this far, congratulations, because you just found, you're about to find out some uh, unique information that I would not tell um, anybody except for the people listening at the end. Um, and that is, um, I'm, I'm entertaining an idea of coming out with a pretty, uh, trying to encapsulate every single law into uh, one giant video. 
It's gonna take me. A it's gonna take me a minute to, to make. Um, as you can imagine, the hundreds of hours I've put into creating all these videos and the dozens of hours of footage that's, that I'm gonna be encapsulating into one video. It's kind of be like gonna be like a 48 Laws of Power visual summary movie, audiobook if you will too. It's just gonna have a visual aspect to it. Now I don't. Yeah. So I'm just entertaining that idea, and uh, I might come out with that soon. I might not. Probably will. We'll see. Law 3, consider intentions. I don't know. I can't tell you. Law 4, always saying this less than necessary. Maybe I said too much. Don't tell anybody. I hope you took a lot of value out of these videos of these 48 Laws of Power. Shout out to Robert Green. I would absolutely love to meet slash talk to him in some way or another. These 48 Laws have uh, really helped me elevate my understanding of the world around me, if anything. Um, especially creating these videos, which is one of the f reasons I did it, was so I could have a deeper understanding of the books I read. I really was trying to solve a problem within myself, and that's memory retention. And I think I've done that very well because you spend hours, hours, and hours reading, re editing, audio, etc. I hope it's uh, elevated your life in some way or another, and I have helped you uh, excel and get better at this, at this life. You know, we only got one of them, as far as I know. Keep doing your thing. I believe in you. I love you. I'm going to keep doing this to the best of my abilities. If you want to feel like donating to my Patreon page, a dollar a month or a dollar a video, cool. I appreciate it. If you don't, cool. I love you. We done. We out.